Hi everybody, it's Saturday, January 22nd, and here's what I'm thinking about today. I'm harking back to my days in the Army, when I was stationed at Marchfield in Riverside, California. After my basic training, the first place they sent me to was a cross-country train trip to Riverside, which was quite a surprise to me because I grew up in California, and here I was going back to Marchfield. Well, Riverside is a nice little town back then, about 30,000 people. And Marchfield was the, one of the biggest things around there, although there were a couple of other military installations too. There was Camp Han, uh, right across the street from Marshfield. And then inside of Riverside itself was another camp, a uh, what they call a POE, where people went just before they were sent overseas. And I cannot remember the name of that base inside of Riverside. After the war, they uh, sold it and people moved in and it's gone now. Anyway, Marchfield was one of the older bases in the country. Uh, they had brick buildings with ivy growing on it, believe it or not, instead of the regular military barracks. So that was quite a surprise to me to get assigned to live in this uh, big brick building with ivy over it and marble showers, really fancy setup. And the people that were stationed in Marshfield permanently, they got to live in this beautiful building. The flight crews, the combat crews that were training there and assigned to their B-24s to fly overseas. They lived over in the crude barracks like all the other army places. I guess they wanted to toughen them up to get ready for battle. But the people who were stationed permanently at March Field, they had a pretty good deal. Anyway, uh, when I first got there, they didn't know what to do with me because I had been a drill instructor and I had been a cadet. Well, they they canceled out a lot of the cadets because they had too many, and I was one of them. So I was assigned to general flunky duty, I guess you could call it. One of the one of the things I had to do was to move the colonel's furniture. Whenever they would change to a new colonel, uh, the the entire base was under the command of a colonel, and when they would bring in a new colonel, they would have people like me that go over there and move the, the colonel's furniture in and out. However, one day, I decided to go into the base radio station and uh, look it over. After all, I'd been a ham operator and I was interested in radio. So I go in there and they had this uh, officer. I think I've got a reflection in my glasses. I'm going to turn the reflection off. There. I hope that turned it off. Anyway, I go into this base radio station and they've got a code uh, key there to send Morse code. So there was this major standing there, and I walked up to him and I asked him, well, what do you have to do to get assigned to work in here? I like the looks of this place. And he said, well, sit down at that telegraph key and send some code. So I sat down and rattled off a few letters, and right away he said, okay, you're in. You're now assigned to this, and he, he was a Major Tim was his name, last name T-I-M-M. And he had the power to transfer me right into that radio station. So I spent the rest of my time at Marsh Field uh, sending code to airplanes. Most of them lost out in the Pacific Ocean. My job was to contact them and guide them into uh, land, either at Riverside or some other base. And we did that all by code, and I got assigned the graveyard shift. So I'd come into this radio station at midnight, stay there till 6 o'clock in the morning, and my job was to listen to about five or six different channels, and if any airplane called in, I would answer them and uh, send them a, a signal to uh, guide them in to wherever they wanted to go. Well, that lasted for a while. But uh, soon after that, I transferred out to OCS. But I, was, I want to stick around about talking about March Field because it was such an interesting place. It's right outside of Riverside. And since I had this graveyard shift, I had all day free to do anything I wanted. So what I did was I went into town and contacted a, 
radio shop there and I got a job repairing radios. Even though I was in the Army, I could still on my off time go in there and work repairing radios. And um, as a matter of fact, I made more money doing that than I did in the Army, which is understandable. A, a private didn't get much pay in the Army. We used to have a, a slogan, uh, a song, and they even made up a song about that. I think it was uh, something like uh, $52 a day once a month or some, something like that for your salary. Anyway, I worked in this radio show, uh, say, uh, shop. The man's name was O.K. Hopkins, and he called it um, Radio Equipment Company. And after the war, what I heard was that he went into television and became a big operation, uh, one of the first stores to sell televisions. And as a matter of fact, after I got out of the Army and went back to Riverside a few years later, I uh, actually bought my first television from that same store that was uh, still going strong in Riverside. Now, uh, let's see, what else do I want to do? Oh, B-24s. The, uh, the combat crews at Marsh Field were assigned to brand new B-24s that were flown in from the River Rouge plant in Detroit, Michigan. They were turning out a B-24 about once every hour. There's an interesting video about that on the internet. And here's this great big factory that the Ford Company put together, and they were turning out a B-24 about once per hour. And these brand new planes would be test flown one time, and then the uh, somebody, uh, ferry pilots would pick them up and fly them uh, to Marshfield, direct from Detroit. They were, they would stop in, um, uh, like Colorado, Denver, I believe it was. They stopped for gas. And once in a while, though, a plane would try to make it all the way. And I remember one case, I happened to be standing on the roof, and here comes this brand new silvery colored B-24, uh, just barely made it over the fence, wheels up. And they did a belly landing, and they slid all the way down this long runway and ground off about the bottom few inches of the brand new plane and totally ruined it. Well, that pilot must have gotten into trouble. Somehow he thought he could make it without stopping for gas, and it turned out he ruined a brand new plane on account of that. Anyway, these brand new planes would be assigned to a brand new crew, 10 guys on each plane. And at first they would go up with the training crew, and each, each training crew would, uh, would be also 10 men, and each guy would train his individual position on the plane, uh, they take a few flights like that, and then the plane's uh, pilot trainer would get off, and when he got off, all the rest of the training crew got off, and the brand new crew would take off in their brand new airplane and head out to the Pacific to the war. Well, every once in a while, one of those guys would get all flustered, being all on his own without the training crew with him, and he would actually crash the plane in, into the mountains near Marsh Field, and several planes crashed that way and killed everybody on board. It was too bad, but most of the planes made it out of there, and they went over to the Pacific War. So um, each plane had, as I say, all oh, ten people. Some of them were just gunners. There was a pilot, a co-pilot, the engineer, radio operator, and I guess the rest of them were gunners. They had machine guns mounted all over that plane. Let's see. Um, oh, one more thing about Riverside. At the time I was there, I was riding a motorcycle. I rode this motorcycle from the March Field into town all the time. And um, there was this motorcycle club started up in a, mo in a motorcycle shop run by Skip Fordyce at Riverside. He started a motorcycle club called the Riverside Bombers, named after the March Field Bombers. And I was one of the original members of that Riverside Bombers Club. Well, they could even still have it today, for all I know, but I, I quit riding a motorcycle a long time ago, so I haven't been keeping up with that. Anyway, uh, one more thing happened funny. When I was at this graveyard shift operation, I was, I was in town on my time off, and um, I actually had a date with this girl. And I, I went over to her house, and after the date, uh, it wasn't time to go back to work at Marsh Field, so I laid down on the sofa in the front room. I was going to take a short nap and then get up and go to work. Well, somehow, I, the short nap took 
a, a long time, and by the time I woke up, it was so I was really late, like four or five o'clock in the morning. I raced up to Marchfield as fast as I could, and the corporal that was on before me had to stay in cover for me, and he was really mad, and he turned in a report that I didn't show up at all. Well, I did show up, but I was late. Uh, so after he left, there I was all by myself, and I, I hate. I guess I'm. This is past the statute of limitations. I can't get in trouble now. But I found his report, and I gave it the deep six in the wastebasket, and I never heard another word about it. He never asked me what happened to the report. Nothing happened, and I didn't get in trouble for being late. But um, soon after that, the base paper had this ad about they wanted people to be in officers' training, uh, be in OCS. And I always wanted to be an officer, naturally, so I put it in for it. It was called the Combat Engineers. Well, I didn't know what an engineer was, but I applied for it anyway, and I got accepted immediately. And a few days later, I got a transfer out of Marshfield, uh, never to return. So the transfer back east to the engineer school is another story. Right now, I'll say goodbye to Marshfield. It's still out there. It's one of the biggest bases in the world, and I imagine they have all these great big planes out there today. I haven't been there lately, but uh, I've driven by it. And I'm sure they, uh, they probably welcome tourists every once in a while to show them around the place. I don't, want, I don't want to promise anything they won't do, but I've heard they might do that. Anyway, until the next time, I'm Red Blanchard, and I say thanks for watching, and I'll see you later.